Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Hey, Food Junkies listeners, Clarissa here, and we are very excited to bring today's episode with Dr. Nicole Avina to you. Dr. Avina was one of our first guests on the podcast three years ago. You can check her out in episode 15. She is an associate professor of neuroscience at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City and a visiting professor of health psychology at Princeton University. She is a research neuroscientist and expert in the fields of nutrition, diet, and addiction, with a special focus on nutrition during early life and pregnancy and women's health. She has done groundbreaking work developing models to characterize food addiction and the dangers of excess sugar intake. Her research achievements have been honored by awards from several groups, including the New York Academy of Sciences, the American Psychological Association, and the National Institute on Drug Abuse. In addition to over 100 peer-reviewed scholarly publications, Dr. Avina has written several popular books, including Why Diets Fail, Because You're addicted to sugar, what to eat when you're pregnant, what to feed your baby and toddler, and what to eat when you want to get pregnant. She frequently appears as a science expert in the media, including regular appearances on Good Day New York, The Doctors, and the former Dr. Oz show, as well as many news programs. Her work has been featured in Time Magazine, Bloomberg Business Week, the New York Times, and many other periodicals. We are so, so grateful she has penetrated the mainstream media. She has the number two most watched TED Education Health Talk, How Sugar Affects Your Brain, with over 17 million views and counting. Every time I do a presentation for the public on food addiction and the dangers of sugar, I include this incredible five-minute video. If you haven't seen it yet, it's definitely worth checking out and sharing. Today, we are chatting with Nicole about her latest book, Sugar Less. Love the title. Coming out next week on December 19th, this book covers the latest science on sugar addiction and how to overcome it. It's available for pre-order now, and you'll hear a little bit about what it covers today in our interview. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. All right. We're so happy to have Dr. Nicole Avina back on the show today. Welcome. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be back here. Awesome. Yeah, you were one of our first Food Junkie podcast interviews, episode 15. So can you let us know what have you been working on since we last interviewed you? I hear you have a book coming out. I do actually. Yeah. So it's been a while since we chatted. What? It's been like about three years, I guess. And it's been busy. There's been so many things going on in the science world as it relates to food addiction. And also for me, I think it's becoming so important to help educate the public around these issues related to sugar addiction and processed food addiction. And so that's why I'm really excited to talk about my new book that's going to be coming out. It's available for pre-order now. It'll be in stores December 19th, and it's called Sugar Less. And it's really a summary of the research as we know it, as it relates to sugar, how sugar affects your health, your mental health, how it affects your brain and can lead to an addiction, and then helps people to kind of unpack all that and figure out, okay, well, now what do I do to break free from this addiction? And so many people struggle with this issue. So I'm really excited to be able to bring this book to the masses. So let's talk about the book. And so I think one of the main questions that I'm hoping, well, I know because I've read the book, (laughs) you (laughs) answer, you know, how does dependence on sugar happen? Like, what is it that we should know and be aware of? How does this phenomenon occur? Well, you know, I think it's really interesting when we think about all the other addictive substances and behaviors that are out there. I think people have a growing awareness that they're developing dependence and they're developing an addiction. So let's just use examples like alcohol. 
if you're regularly drinking alcohol, you know you're putting yourself at risk to become dependent on it, but you know when you're drinking alcohol and when you're not. And you usually don't start drinking alcohol, hopefully, until you're an adult. The problem with sugar is that it's so pervasive in our food environment that people are over consuming it from a very young age. They're consuming it when they don't even realize they're consuming it. So it's really almost this like passive addiction that develops for a lot of people where they don't even realize they're consuming something that's altering their brain and causing them to become dependent on it often until they have health problems or until, you know, they have an issue where maybe they have gained 15 or 20 pounds. And now they're starting to reflect on, well, what's going on? Why is this happening? So I think that how the dependence develops is really, you know, one of those things that makes it unique in terms of the field of addiction, because it is something that a lot of people find it just kind of happens gradually because they don't realize how much sugar they're consuming. And can you speak a little bit more about like also how our society uses these foods as a reward and how that can be so problematic, especially for children? It is a big problem. And I think, you know, there's a couple of different ways to think about this. And so when we think about palatable food, high sugar foods, they're used as a way to self-medicate. And, you know, we do this even with our kids, you know, believe it or not, my pediatrician, (laughs) I love her for my kids, but she still believes in giving out lollipops if the kids behave during the visit, which is, you know, something that we've kind of passed down from generation to generation. And maybe that was okay when kids only got a lollipop when they went to the pediatrician, but now they're getting lollipops all day long. And it's a way to help kids and for us as adults too, to feel better, right? We know that in the brain, it's releasing dopamine, it's affecting the brain opioid system. So it's actually serving as a bit of a painkiller. And, you know, that can be okay once in a while. But what happens is that people get into this pattern where they're constantly using these foods to self-soothe, to self-medicate, to manage anxiety, to manage the daily stressors of life and all the different things that are happening. And so I think that, you know, when we think about how this happens, it's again, it's one of those things that sort of happens underneath the curtain. We don't even realize that it's happening or we're using these types of foods in that way. Again, until a problem emerges and until it becomes something where we realize that sort of aha moment that, you know, I I have to do something about this because this isn't really a healthy way to have a relationship with food. Yeah. And it even goes beyond that, right? Like, so certainly there's like the self-medication aspect, there's the reward aspect, but then we're also being marketed and have been marketed to for decades now, like this idea of like a value meal or a a quick meal, right? And is there any value in choosing those meals really, you know, and what if we feel like we don't have another choice? Like, can we do something to minimize the harm? So like, are they good choices? And even if they're not good choices, can we make them better? Talk to us about like what has happened to our society, to our food environment. Yeah, it's so interesting. So, you know, that term value, right? Value meal. I know very little about economics, but I know that, you know, if something is of value, that means it's a good investment, right? And so it's not a good investment in your health to buy a value meal. Because even though in that moment, it might be convenient, it might you know, seem like, oh, I'm getting all this extra food for less money. And this means I'll be, you know, making a wise decision financially. Well, if you really look at, you know, the lifespan and your health span, what you're spending on that value meal, you're going to actually be paying, you know, a lot more for in terms of paying for the health problems that you're likely to have as a result of, you know, eating those types of meals quite often. And I think you're right that, Our society has become constructed in a way that, you know, we're constantly being sort of told that it's okay to choose these convenience foods and that you should save time and that you should, you know, that'll allow you to have more time to do other things that you need to do. And I think a lot of it, to be quite honest, is the fact that we have become so overbooked personally, right? I mean, I know I'm overbooked and I don't do it on purpose, but it's just, you know, a fact of life. You have, families, you have job responsibilities, things you want to do with your friends, you want to work out, you have all these things that you want to do, and something's got to give. And for most people, 
when we have these foods that are marketed as healthy, marketed as, oh, well, this is a convenient option. It's good for you. It's all natural. It's organic. You know, the food industry has all of these terms that they use that really are code words for the fact that, you know what, this is not necessarily healthy for you. And I think that when you start to take a look at a lot of these highly processed foods, many of them say they're organic. Many of them say they're plant-based, but they're still really ultra processed foods that have tons of added sugar. And that's just really not good for our health in the long term. Yeah, I absolutely couldn't agree more. It's like, it is just this very overproductive society that we live in with that has, you know, kidnapped all our time. And so food becomes an afterthought and completely convenience-based. So I imagine we have some listeners who may be just starting this process, or maybe they have been, you know, already at this for a while and haven't quite figured it out. I think your book does an amazing job of establishing the dangers of overconsuming sugar. I also think there's lots of tips and tools in there for people who are looking to figure out how do I break this dependence on sugar? Can you share a little bit about you know where someone might get started? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's, I think, really what makes the book Sugarless unique is that you know a lot of times people have been sort of caught in this sugar vortex for quite a while. And they've tried certain things to get out, and they've, you know, maybe tried things that you know work for a little bit and then they don't work. And then that means that they feel guilty and shame because they feel like, oh, I I don't have the willpower and this is my fault. And in the book, I really try to have the readers understand that, you know, this is an addiction. This is a brain condition. And these foods are co-opting your brain. And so you have to remove, you know, the whole concept that this is a moral failing and that you don't have the willpower, because that's really, I think, the thing that holds people back the most is that they talk to themselves in that way. So if they do, you know, have a slip up where maybe they eat two pieces of cake or something that they maybe are regretting now, the way I talk about this in the book is that, you know, you have to use it as a part of your journey and as a teaching moment to yourself, not as an excuse to throw in the towel and say, oh, forget it. I'm going to just start, you know, eating better on Monday or something like that. And so a lot of what I do in the book is really helping people to kind of look at the psychology of this and how you talk to yourself and how you have this relationship with food. Now, in terms of where to start, I think that's always the big issue for people because what I've found in the past is that most people who have had a hard time managing their sugar intake are really struggling because when they have tried to remove it from their diet, they do it cold turkey. They just wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm never having sugar again. And that's great. And I know lots of people have been able to do that and they have been successful. And I am so, so, so proud of those people. However, I do think that there are a significant number of individuals who cannot do that. And they've tried that and it doesn't work for them. And so I talk in the book about how, you know, you can slowly but surely identify the sugars in your diet because that's also a barrier. A lot of people don't even realize which foods have sugar in them. And then work to get those foods out of your diet, but replace them with things that you still enjoy. So it's not about depriving yourself or, you know, missing out on anything that you enjoy. It's about figuring out, okay, which are the foods that have lots of added sugar so I can figure out why I like them and then put something else into their place. And I'm a really big advocate in the book for, you know, the fact that I have seven steps that I outline for individuals, but those aren't linear and you can bounce around on these steps and it might mean that you're on step four, but now you're going back to step three because you didn't feel like you quite mastered that step. And that's okay. I think that we have this like linear society, right? Where everybody's got to climb to the top and, you know, it's always in this like one direction, but real life doesn't work like that. And so I I try to highlight that in the book for the readers so that they can understand that the steps are built so that, you know, they're realistic for real live human beings, not, you know, somebody who's on some train that's going to take them right to the top. And I know as a addiction professional and a mental health professional, you know, we're always trying to come up with language that is less polarizing, Mm -hmm. less shameful, right? We never want to do harm, that kind of thing. And I know in your book, you really talked about, you know, slip ups and kind of framing 
when people maybe are not linear in taking the steps Mm -hmm. and really highlighting like there's no rush. Like let's just kind of like slowly but surely implement these things so that we're not diving headfirst into the three foot end of the pool. And (laughs) these can be lasting Mm -hmm. changes. Can you kind of talk about like what were your, when you were talking about slip ups, like what were your best hopes for people when they read that section? Like what would they, that they would take from that? Well, I think that, you know, my experience has been that people when they have these slip ups or setbacks or, you know, whatever the term is we want to use, where essentially, you know, they go off of their intended plan that, you know, people can sometimes really beat themselves up about that. And that is not necessary. And that is actually, you know, part of the process of making changes in your behavior is to learn what we need to do in order to get the behaviors to stick. So just going back to like, Psych 101, basic psychology. If I want to teach my puppy how to sit down and give me his paw, it's not going to happen. I'm not going to say, sit, give me your paw, and the puppy's going to do it. No, there's going to be a quite a few times where I'll have to like tap his little bottom to get him to sit down and then give him a treat. And then, you know, eventually we'll get to the point where he'll do that on his own. And then eventually we'll get him to give me his paw. But we use successive approximations. And he's going to make mistakes. He's going to, you know, sit there and bark and do these things. And he's, you know, you know, not going to give up and say, forget it. I don't want the treat. I'm going to sit here until I get what I want. And I think the same thing has to happen for us for trying to regain our health. You know, you're going to have slip ups, but that doesn't mean you give up. And you can't use that as an excuse to throw in a towel. You have to use it as a learning moment and a teaching moment to yourself. And learn from it, grow from it. What was the reason why you gave in at that particular time and decided to maybe, you know, eat something that you're now regretting or you're, you know, wishing you hadn't. And, you know, maybe it was because you had a bunch of things to do for work or you were upset about an argument you had with your spouse, whatever it might be, recognize that and say, okay, well now I need to be extra vigilant when those things happen because I want to have another way to cope with that stressor or cope with that situation that doesn't involve me eating certain foods. And again, I think when people kind of adopt that mindset around this, then it becomes a lot easier to stick to a plan that allows you to forgive yourself. And I think that's what I'm hoping people will take when they read that part of the book. Yeah, I think it makes sense, right? That self-shaming keeps us stuck, but that self-compassion can keep us searching for solutions. And I think that that is the biggest piece is that, you know, this is a journey, especially in addiction recovery, you know, that return to use or slips are always going to be part of the process. With food, it's just compounded because it's everywhere. It's all the time. It's 24 hours a day. So that does make the journey more challenging for a lot of people. Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, because again, like you said, we're talking about food and there's so many shades of gray. This is one of the issues that, you know, I've been talking a lot about that I'm hoping we can start to see some changes on coming down the road, but just the way we define what a food is, right? You go to the grocery store and it contains food, right? But I mean, half of the things in the grocery store aren't necessarily food. I personally think they should redesign the grocery stores to kind of go from like, you know, the things that we know are fruit, like fruits, vegetables, proteins, things like that. And then eventually like, you know, have it be almost like a a spectrum where you could like go to the complete other end where all the processed foods are, the stuff that really is not actually food. It's like next to the toilet paper and the, you know, cleaning products, like put that all over there. Because I think a lot of people, you know, don't realize that the foods that are in our environment in many ways are engineered in a way to make them taste delicious so that we keep buying them and want to eat more and more of them because, hey, let's face it, it's a business. People want to sell their products. And so I think that, you know, in our present food environment, it is challenging. It is extremely challenging. And that's why we need to be even more forgiving to ourselves when, you know, things happen. Yeah, absolutely. And so when people experience slip ups, sometimes it is maybe for a few days or maybe, you know, like, you know, it's a month before they decide to get back on track and try to be live a healthier life, maybe sugar free. And so in this period, we know they may experience withdrawal again. And I know in your book, you talk a lot about the withdrawal process 
Can you share with our audience some of the best ways or some of from the work that you've been doing is how they can handle the process better? Yeah, withdrawal is so interesting when it comes to sugar because it's really different for everybody. And, you know, it's going to depend on the amount of sugar you've been consuming, how long it's been like that. I mean, you know, I've worked with people who have basically been overeating sugar since they were born because they grew up in households where, you know, that's, that was it. That's what the types of foods that they were consuming and they carried that into their adulthood. And it's just really difficult because they have this history. Now, one of the things I will say about the withdrawal is that it doesn't last forever, right? It, it lasts for a couple of weeks, two weeks, maybe at most. And it gets easier and easier as the time goes on. And the symptoms are things that you can be on the lookout for. So typical types of withdrawal symptoms that you would see if maybe somebody was trying to quit smoking cigarettes. So irritability is a big one, being cranky. So I often tell people, you know, if you're going to snap at somebody, just make sure you let them know ahead of time that I'm I'm changing my diet in a way that may cause me to be slightly irritable, but I still love you and I'm sorry. I think that it's always a good idea to sort of preempt that. <laughs> And also, you know, another issue that people often will face during withdrawal are things like headaches and lethargy. Those are two big ones that can be tricky because a lot of times people will think that that's their body's way of telling them that they are having low blood sugar. Now, I guarantee you, and it's great, a lot of people monitor their blood glucose levels all the time so they can have the data to prove that that's not the case. But odds are that if you have given up sugar and suddenly you have a headache and you feel tired or sluggish, it's not your blood sugar, it is your withdrawal. And that's just our body's reaction to you know moving away from the constant stimulation of our dopamine system by being, you know, fed sugar all the time. And so I think that, you know, recognizing the symptoms is really important. And I think, you know, having things in your toolbox to help you manage them, having distractions, having, you know, other things that are occupying your time. So you're not necessarily thinking about those withdrawal symptoms is really a great thing. I would say, you know, redo one of the rooms in your home, paint the walls, get new furniture, plan some like major project that you can handle that will occupy your mind. And that's a really great way to distract yourself during that period. Because like I said, it's an acute phase. For some people, it feels terrible. For some people, it's less you know severe, but it really is something that you kind of have to get through. Once you're on the other side of it, you feel so much better. So often something that we find that goes along with withdrawal, I mean, with any substance, right, is that craving. And even for behavior, you know, you can like crave wanting to like hit the button on the machine, you know, or whatever. But would you advise people to do something different when it comes to cravings versus withdrawal? Like, how do you help or in the book, what do you talk about as far as what we can do to curb cravings? Well, I think cravings are also unique because we have to realize that there are different types of cravings. So we have physiological cravings when we're hungry. So these would be the cravings when, you know, okay, it's almost lunchtime and I haven't had anything to eat in a few hours. I'm starting to feel like I want to have something. That is a biological response that our body makes that is telling us that we need to eat certain foods to get nutrients, to get calories. Now, there's another type of craving that is more predominant, and that is hedonic cravings. And these are the types of cravings that people have when they're completely satiated, they're not they don't need any calories, they're not nutrient deficient in any way, but they suddenly crave the pleasurable feelings that they get from certain types of foods. And sometimes this is completely subconscious. Sometimes you don't even realize that. This is why marketing is so important. People who are in marketing will tell you that you never advise a company that's doing well to change their logo. And if you think about some of the common, you know, I don't want to throw any companies under the bus, but if we think about some of the common companies that have been around for 50, 60, 70 years, fast food establishments, they really don't change their logos because that logo triggers the craving. That logo caught when you see it, that causes your brain to subconsciously recall 
the pleasurable feelings you had when you consumed that food. And so again, you know, those are not cravings that we want to get into. Those are the ones that are us being in this machine of our food environment. And we need to recognize that. So what I tell people is, you know, when you feel a craving, come on, you, you need to pause and then say, is this hunger or is this me craving pleasure? Because if it's craving pleasure, then let's find something else to do that's pleasurable because you don't want to use food as a way to pleasure ourselves, right? We want to enjoy our food, of course, and, you know, love the foods that we're eating, but we don't want to use it as a way to get high. And I think that when people are, you know, cognizant of the type of craving that they're experiencing, then they can make a better decision. And, you know, when people are struggling with cravings and managing them, one of the things that I'll often say is, you know what, you need to like step away. You need to step away from your routine a little bit. Don't go walking past those stores that are triggers for you, where you have all those marketing tools that are causing you to, you know, have those cravings triggered in your brain. Change up your routine a little bit. Maybe go to a park and walk around or, you know, do something else. Just get out of your routine because that can help to break those associations and make it so much easier to battle those cravings. Yeah. And so, I would say then maybe now we've got through the withdrawal. We've got through those like more acute, intense cravings because we know as time goes on, they diminish and become less and less frequent and intense. And so now, you know, I'm feeling pretty stable and how I'm eating, but here comes stress. So how do I not fall back on some of those old behaviors? Stress, I think, is really something that people have a hard time managing. And it's not even the stress itself because we all have stress. There's, you know, stressors in our lives. It's not the stress, it's how you manage the stress. And I think that one of the things that people often default to is to manage their stress with food by putting a Band-Aid on that stress, right? Because if you eat a lot of these palatable foods, it can temporarily make you feel like you're coping with the stress and everything's fine, but that's not the case. And so One of the things that I think we need to be mindful about is that, you know, if you are feeling overwhelmed, if you have a lot of stressors, let's address that. Let's figure out, okay, well, let's figure out what we can do to make this manageable, to, you know, delegate things, to reschedule things, figure out a way in which we can manage the stressors that are in our life so that we don't feel like we need to self-medicate that stress with something like food. So I think, again, you know, it's not just about, you know, what are we going to do when we're stressed, but it's also about getting to that source of those stressors because otherwise you're not solving any of your problems. You're just putting, you know, a bandaid on it for now. I really think it's important. I talk about this in the book to, you know, kind of get to the root of the problems. If you're stressed out because, you know, you have too many appointments and things going on, then okay, well, let's figure out what you can cut out. Right. And so come up with a solution, not just the bandaid. That's, really the message about that. And when we're thinking about that, and I know we talked about slip ups, you know, so the stress and maybe it leads to slip ups or some sort of like relearning or rediscovery period, you know, what would you say is like, what is the thing I should be aiming for when I want to come back from a setback, you know, that something's happened along the way. It's been one of these stressors. It's been something, maybe it wasn't even stress. Maybe it was just like, putting the thing in my mouth without even thinking about it, you know, or whatever. Right. And now I feel like, oh, I just messed it all up. Oh my God, I'm back to zero, day zero. What do you suggest? Well, I often tell people that there is no day zero. There's no restart. Your life is going on. It's happening. And so this is, you know, part of that journey. And so there's no reset. It's just recognizing that okay, well, I'm going to learn from whatever just happened. And that should motivate you that you're taking that initiative to keep going and not throw in the towel. And because it's very easy to quit everybody, you know, Hey, that's the easiest thing in the world is to quit eating healthy, right? Because it's just like the default in our society these days, when you go out and see again, all those restaurants and fast food and all of these products, these ultra processed foods, it is the default to, you know, just give into that. But if you're choosing not to do that, then you're succeeding and you're making a step in the right direction. And I think that it's important for people to realize that this is a lifetime change that we're making. This isn't a quick fix. This isn't like, oh, I want to lose 10 pounds. This is 
about your health and longevity. And I really try to make a point in the book about highlighting how, you know, this isn't just about how we look. It's actually very little to do with how we look. It's about our health. It's about how sugar affects our physical health, how it affects our mental health, and how when we can reduce it in our diet, it's going to make us just feel better. And that is what the goal is, is to feel better, to live better, to live longer, and to live healthier. And if we can kind of look at this as like the in the long term, I think it's very helpful for people. And we have to get away from this whole diet mentality of, oh, I have to go on a diet because I gained 10 pounds or 20 pounds, or my doctor said I need to lose weight. Okay, well, you know what your doctor should have said is you should try to eat healthier so that you can stay healthier for as long as you live. And that's got to be the goal. It's got to be more of a journey and less of this, you know, let me do whatever I can to really quickly lose weight. It's about health, not necessarily weight. Yeah, with that is so our messaging, Nicole. So I love for you to reinforce that. I also love what you said there is the easiest thing to like quit quitting sugar and mm-hmm. that everyone around us is already doing, you know, what we're not trying not to do that. Therefore there's all this other social pressure because it's so normalized in our society. And because, you know, grandma's bringing you the pie or mom's made your favorite cookie. So how do we deal with those social pressures? You know, it's so interesting that you asked this because I have two daughters. One's a teenager and the other one's eight years old. And one of the things that my husband and I really focus on with them is to be independent thinkers and to not go with the crowd and to not feel compelled to be pressured by their peers. And obviously this is, you know, something that I think all parents think about and and are concerned about, right? But I think that when we think about what we're eating, we have to have that same mindset. Like we're talking to a pre-teenage girl and trying to have her understand that you need to be your own person. You're not going to, if the kids are drinking or doing drugs, like you're not doing that, you do what you think is right. And I think we need to tell ourselves that when we get in those situations where, you know, these foods are kind of being pushed on us in social settings, you know, you have to kind of channel your inner teenage girl there. And I think say to yourself, like, you know what? No, just because everyone else is doing that. I know it's not healthy. I don't want to do that. So I'm not going to give in just because everyone else is doing it. And so I think it's about standing out, you know, not blending in and doing what everyone else does, which I know kind of goes against human nature to some degree, because as humans, we tend to want to be a part of the group and not dissent from the group. But if you want to shine, you got to stand out. You got it right. People are paying attention to the person that's standing out and doing the different thing. And so I think that that's important. So if, you know, you have, and I go through this in the book about, you know, different types of situations that you might encounter socially where food is involved and you have your sort of arsenal of, you know, lines that you have to say to somebody so that you can get yourself out of that situation, then you have that equipment to be independent and you don't have to, you know, fold into the crowd just because people are doing it. I think it's really about, you know, standing up for yourself, standing up for your health and understanding that you're the only person who knows what's best for you. And so if you have somebody, you know, pushing cake on you or saying, oh, come on, it's so-and-so's birthday. Let's have a piece of cake. Don't you want to celebrate? You know, yeah, you're celebrating that person because, you know, you're happy for them and you love them. You don't have to eat cake to show them that, right? you can give them a hug. (laughs) So I think that it's really about, and I talk about this in sugar lists, really about having that planned out. And in your mind, having that conversation with yourself about how, you know, no, I'm not going along with the group. I'm going to stand out because that's what I would tell my teenage daughter if I didn't want her drinking. (laughs) I know I have so many thoughts on this, right? Like I think about back to my fourth and fifth grade days where like we had the dare program, right? And it was like, just say no. And, and I don't think they still do dare, but they, you know, they, they have red ribbon week and they have like all of these different programs now, right. To teach children how to say no to drugs and alcohol and whatever else. And I think, you know, we have this expectation of children to say no to these things, you know, these hard drugs or alcohol or whatever it might be. 
you know, maybe even just risky behavior. And then it's almost like we sometimes forget that we could hold ourselves accountable for saying no to something that isn't good for us either, right? For one reason or another, maybe it's because we know we have some sort of binge reaction or Mm -hmm. craving reaction or whatever it might be, you know? And then I also think about how being that person that stands out from the group can be so shaming all over again for us. If we have, you know, like a trauma history, which a lot of people, you know, with eating disorders, disordered eating, food addiction often do. It's just a comorbidity that occurs. You know, we know that to be true. And I think, you know, to go back to your earlier points of like, go slow and, you know, talk to people who are maybe doing the same thing that you're doing. So maybe you're standing out from the group that you're with currently. Maybe it's your group of friends or your family, whatever. You're saying no to the foods that they're offering but maybe, and maybe that feels bad because you're separating from the group, but finding a group of people who are doing the same thing and then showing up there and saying like, oh, I just had this experience and it felt so bad, but I know it's the right thing for me. Like, I imagine that could be very healing for somebody. Absolutely. And, you know, I think it's about knowing what group you're in, right? And so you can be comfortable in terms of, you know, how you're reacting. But I also think it's important to, and again, to your point of how people, you know, might find it difficult to be that one to stand up and stand out if they have this, you know, history of trauma or, you know, like this has been something that has been difficult for them. I think about that and I would say you could be the hero for somebody who is in that group who needs to have someone stand up and be the person that says, no, I'm good. I'm I'm not going to have that. And I think that, you know, For those individuals, I think that if you need something to boost your courage to stand up, just know that there's somebody in that group that could need you to stand up. It might not, you might not be doing it just for you. You might be doing it for other people. And I think it's important, you know, to understand that because so many people silently struggle with this for years and years. And it takes a leader. It takes one dissenter. There's all these social psychology experiments, classic social psychology studies that you know, talk about that, how it just takes one person to dissent from the group in order to get other people to start to dissent and to be different. And I think that's what we need to have. And that's what's, you know, starting to happen where we're starting to hear people stand up and say, you know what? No, I'm not going to eat like this. I'm not going to eat all these processed foods. We know this is bad for us. Like, why are we doing it? And, you know, hearing those voices is just going to allow more voices to come in. So I think that it's a great part of the conversation to, you know, be able to understand how these different pieces are coming together. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of dissension, (laughs) you are a person out there with a pretty big platform, I'd say, I mean, compared to other people that we know in the field and, you know, you've been able to take your sugar addiction messaging and reach a mainstream audience. I mean, do you ever receive negative feedback because you do, you stand out, right? Like you're pushing back against eating disorder. You're pushing back against intuitive eating. Like, and it, maybe you're not purposely saying those things or intentionally saying those things, but your message absolutely has to rub people wrong. Have you received negative feedback? Oh, of course. Yes, of course. And I welcome the negative feedback because it helps me to think about what messages I'm trying to communicate to people to make sure that I'm articulating them the way that I really fully intend them to be articulated. And, you know, I would say that, you know, there are groups of individuals, again, like you mentioned about like the intuitive eating movement, and even in some cases, certain philosophies regarding treatment of eating disorders where, you know, all foods are good foods and you should be able to eat every food in moderation. Well, that might have been true back in 1940 when we didn't have all these, you know, massive amounts of human engineered products in our food stores, when most people were eating, you know, fruits and vegetables, and maybe, you know, grandma baked a pie or cake or cookie once in a while, and that was the dessert. Nowadays, it's a different environment. And I don't think that many of the foods that are called foods are actually food, (laughs) if that makes sense. They're engineered products that you can supposedly eat, but I don't think they're food. They're not nourishing you in the way that real food would. And so, you know, my, I guess, response to those types of thoughts are, you know, you can't 
consider all foods to be good foods and expect everybody to eat everything in moderation when a lot of these products don't even really, in my opinion, meet the criteria for being a food. And also when we know that these quote unquote foods can hijack the brain and cause you to become addicted to them. That's like telling somebody who's, you know, an alcoholic to just have a little alcohol or just do a little bit of cocaine. Like you don't have to do whatever, the whole boat of it. And so I think that, you know, when we talk about the addiction piece, you know, we start to realize that, you know what, we can't apply these like, oh, you should be able to just use a little bit and do it in moderation when we're talking about certain types of foods. And so I think that, you know, any type of discussion around this topic is so important to have because there's going to be varying opinions and there should be. That's the type of world we want to live in where we have all these opinions. We can have these discussions. But I think that it really does kind of strengthen the argument that, you know, if foods are addictive, it's really difficult to tell somebody that there is addicted to food. Yeah, just have a little bit of it. That's not something that most people can do. Yeah. And it makes it even more challenging when like these news articles are coming out and some of these proponents are actually being funded by big food to share this messaging that all foods fit and, you know, feed your kid cookies for breakfast and then they won't want it anymore. Like that, that, you know, it's just very interesting and, and yet can be so harmful at the same time in this body acceptance movement where it's, it's about health. It's not about like surface body. It's about what is actually happening to you inside your organs, your brain, like you said, your mental health and your emotional health. And so I'm wondering, you know, like, We know that right now society is dependent on a lot of these foods and certainly sugar. And so what do you think it's going to take to change society's dependence on these foods and substances, I would say? Well, I would say that it's going to take more effort on the part of us working to communicate the science. And, you know, getting that out there to people because we're fighting against the marketing machines of the food industry that are pushing the message that, oh, yeah, all these foods are great. Just, you know, eat them in moderation, but they're still okay to eat and give your kids, you know, cereal for breakfast. It's loaded with sugar. That's okay because it's, you know, high in fiber or they'll pull out some, you know, random fact that, you know, maybe they could claim actually is true and By the way, it's also got two cups of sugar in it, but let's not talk about that. So I think it's going to really just take more on the part of scientists like me and, you know, advocates like you guys just talking about this and getting the message out. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, I'm so excited to be getting Sugarless, my new book out there, because that's essentially what the book is doing. It's summarizing the science and explaining it in a way so that people hopefully we'll have that aha moment and they'll realize, you know what, these food products are not good for me. Even though I've been, you know, lied to and manipulated into thinking that they're healthy and that it's okay to have them once in a while, that's not what's happening. They're actually, you know, causing harm to my physical health, my mental health, and they're getting me hooked on them so that I'm, you know, stuck in this machine. And I really think that if we can get more and more people talking about this, we're going to eventually be able to apply the pressure that needs to be applied to, you know, get the food companies to be responsible. Now, we've had some progress. I've been doing this work for over 20 years now. I started doing the research on sugar addiction back when I was a graduate student at Princeton. We did the first studies looking at whether or not sugar could be addictive. We developed an animal model. And I feel like we've come a long way since then. I really do. Because when we first started doing this work, and I I go through this in the book as well, kind of the history of sort of where we've come and where we're going, it was not recognized as a concept even back then. And now when we talk about sugar addiction amongst medical groups, amongst psychology groups, Yes. People say, yes, we we believe that food addiction is a thing. We just don't know what to do about it. I think that's where we are now is that the science is undeniable, right? We've amassed this massive amount of literature 
on that topic in human studies, in animal models. I mean, there is a ton of research. I don't really think anyone is disputing the research anymore. That's what it was in the beginning. When I first started publishing on this, people would say, oh, well, those are just rat studies, so it doesn't mean anything. Okay, then the clinical studies came along. And then it was like, oh, well, you know, we don't know what, that's just in certain populations. We don't know if that's happening in the masses. And then more and more studies came out. And so now the narrative becomes, oh yeah, maybe it does meet the criteria for addiction. Okay, so what are we gonna do about it, right? And so I think that's where we are now is, you know, we either need to have food addiction and sugar addiction be recognized as an addiction, just like, you know, gambling is, just like drugs and alcohol, or or they got to change the definition of addiction, right? Because, I mean, those are the only two options. If it meets the criteria for addiction, it's an addiction. So either change the criteria or, you know, let this be recognized because when we can do that, we're going to be able to help even more people and that'll open up even more doors. And I think we're going there. It's just that we're not quite there, but I'm hopeful that we'll get there soon. For sure. And I I know Clarissa and I kind of work behind this, right? Like there's this top down approach, but also I think there can be this bottom up approach and things like your book, you getting out there on television, newspaper article, you know, I mean, you've, again, you've been able to somehow manage to get mainstream media to pay attention. And yeah, I think it's going to be a vote with your forks, like read the books, pay attention to the interviews, read the research papers. If you have access to them, you know, get out there and go to the stores and actually buy foods that are going to nourish you, that are going to move you closer to what you want. And, you know, there will be some, somewhere along the line, somebody will start to listen to us because their pocketbooks, right? Coca-Cola, whoever, right? Like we've heard before, they don't care what they're selling as long as they sell something. So if we are voting with our forks, if we're voting at the grocery store and we're buying the things that make more sense as like a proper human diet, we definitely maybe will have like some more traction and and I, that's what I think I love the most about your book is you wrap up with just these beautiful recipes at the end, you know, because I have young children, they're 10 and seven. And I think about this all the time, you know, like, how do I, because I try to get them to eat the things that I eat, but it's, you know, it's a little too obscure for their taste buds just yet. Right. And so we all love a good recipe and mo- many of us have young children. And I'm just wondering, you know, like, How can we convince them that these are like good choices for us, that this food tastes good because it's going to be challenging? And do you have a favorite that works in your family that maybe I can start with? (laughs) Yeah. So the recipes are so fun. I love developing recipes. And one of the things about the recipes, there's 30 recipes in Sugarless and there's no added sugar in any of them. There's no alternative sweeteners in any of them either. And so I think that you know, having just some ideas to get you started can really help. And so, you know, I also think having the recipe is is important because it brings us back into the kitchen, right? I mean, it's so funny because I have friends that are, you know, building new houses and, you know, kind of settling into their forever homes and they're building these like massive kitchens and everyone wants this big fancy kitchen, but then they don't ever cook at it, right? <laughs> And so I think that, you know, my hope with the recipes is it's going to inspire people to get back into the kitchen. And this is something that, you know, we've been really passionate about doing with our kids. I love to cook. I love to create fun and different recipes. And my younger daughter, she's kind of caught on to it. And now she's taking cooking lessons and she's helped with a lot of, you know, the recipe development. So she's She's definitely been integral in the process. But one of the ones that I absolutely love that you might want to try with your kids is the unbelievable ice cream sundae. There's no ice cream in it. It's unbelievable, right? So it is really just a great way to kind of get that satisfaction for something cold and creamy, but no added sugar. And so that's one that is usually a big hit in our house. And then even like you were saying about how, you know, sometimes it's hard to get the kids on board with, you know, certain tastes because a lot of times what's happened is our kids have become so accustomed to eating sugar and they associate certain foods with having a lot of sugar, right? And so the other recipe that I really love is our blueberry oatmeal muffins. And so these are no added sugar, but I will tell you that you could fool any child with these because the way in which we've created this recipe 
you would be shocked to learn that there's no sugar in it. And so I really think it's about, you know, trying out some different things and, you know, hopefully these recipes will inspire people to come up with their own sugar-free recipes and to just get back in the kitchen. Because I really think that, you know, if we're going to make the changes that we all want to make and see happen, that's also one of the things we got to vote with our fork, but we also have to vote with our time and what we're devoting our time to. And I, you know, I love to cook. I grew up in, my grandmother lived in our house and she was a little old Italian lady. And, you know, she cooked all day long. The woman was always cooking. And I grew up with that. So to me, that became something that, you know, I was interested in and passionate about. And I'm fortunate that I'm now hopefully passing that on to my children. But I think that, you know, you don't have to love to cook. If you love your health, then you're going to love to cook, right? <laughs> it, the two go together. So if you can find some more ways to, you know, prepare more meals at home and eat things at home and control the ingredients that you're putting into them, you're doing yourself a great service and your family a great service. You're making that food healthier. Every meal counts. And if you can, you know, change one meal where you were going to, you know, get takeout or, you know, get something on the go and instead whip something up at home, that's a win. That's a big win. I love that, especially for all those perfectionists out there that like that rigidity. One meal can make a difference. Like even if it's one meal a week, you know, you're always going to be adding to your health when you remove some of those convenience foods. So can you share with us, obviously your book is coming out. Where can our audience find out more about it? And is there anything else you're doing other than book promotion going on? Yeah. So the book Sugarless will be out in stores on December 19th. It's available for pre-order now. So you can order it on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles. You can also find information about it on my website, drnicoleavina.com. And, you know, the next big thing for me, I think is really just going to be keep on keeping on, right? Just keep on pushing out this message, helping people to understand about the science and really just to help people be empowered to take control over their health. Because I think that's a big part of it is a lot of people just feel like they don't know where to start. They feel like they're kind of stuck with all of these different things that we've been talking about happening. They got stress. They don't like to cook. There's all these convenience foods that are just so much easier and they get all this pleasure from eating that food. So why would I want to stop doing it? And it becomes overwhelming. And so the book really does break it down and make it so that you're not trying to deal with all this stuff at once in an incremental way that's actually manageable. And it's something that will allow it to stick. And I think that's really, you know, the main message of the book is, you know, if you want to change your life, you have to start somewhere and you have to start by making these small changes. And those are all changing your life. Even if the smallest little step is still a big change. From a harm reduction clinician, we love your messaging. So thank you so much for being on the podcast today, Nicole. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one -on -one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours. <laughs>